Hello, everybody. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, a proposal for how we might describe um, treatment effect heterogeneity in um, individual patient data meta-analysis. Um, so the conventional approach when we um, think about um, conducting a meta-analysis is to take a summary um, treatment effect estimate and standard error from each of our different studies, pull them together um, to obtain our pooled estimate of the treatment effect. When we have individual patient data, um, we've got to choose two choices for our approach. We can either do a two-stage approach, and in a two-stage approach, we pool our individual level data um, into point estimates and standard errors, and then we take each of those point estimate and standard errors from our different studies and pool just as we would using a regular meta-analysis. Alternatively, if we do have access to the individual level data, we can do something that's called a one-stage approach, and that's sort of going to be the focus of what I'm going to talk, to, talk about today. There are also two other choices that we've got when we do a meta-analysis. Um, we can decide either that our, there's a common treatment effect across our studies, and so model everything using fixed effects, or as is more conventional, we allow for the fact that there's very probably going to be heterogeneity of the treatment effects across the studies, and we choose to conduct a random effects meta-analysis. And I'm going to focus on the random effects case. So when we want to test for treatment effect heterogeneity, as Julian mentioned, we can use this test called the Q statistic. And essentially, that's the sum of the square differences between the study specific estimates and the pooled estimate, waiting to allow for the fact that some of our studies are bigger and, and, and lend more information than others do. Now, when um, the studies are all of a similar size, then we can describe the treatment effect heterogeneity using the I-squared statistic. And in those situations where the studies are of a similar size and each of them is contributing a similar weight, then as Julian said, that the I-squared statistic is very roughly equal to the between study heterogeneity by the sum of the between plus the within study heterogeneity. Now, actually, in fact, um, when we're doing a meta-analysis, most of the times the studies do vary in size, they do have different numbers of outcomes, and they will contribute different weights. So it turns out that actually, in fact, I squared is actually a function of, of Q and K, where K is the number of studies. But nonetheless, when things are of a similar size, I squared has this nice approximation to be the ratio of the between divided by the between plus within. And I'm going to come back to that formula later. Um, but as Julian said, the I-squared statistic has its limitations, and actually, in fact, it can be more informative to present what we call <clears throat> the predictive interval. And essentially, that represents the region within which we expect that 95% of the um, um, future trial-specific um, estimates will fall within. And that's a function of our pooled estimate, our tor squared between study variation and the standard error of our pooled estimate. And then it's conventional there to use a t-distribution with k minus one degrees of freedom, where k is our number of studies. So I'm going to illustrate that approach here using some um, simulated indip indip individual participant data. Um, simulated with a continuous outcome, lots of um, treatment effect heterogeneity, the underlying truth, if you like, of this data, um, the I squared was 91%. So simulate this individual participant data um, and then summarize um, each study separately by its study specific treatment effect using a two stage approach and then taking all those study specific estimates and their standard errors pull across using a random effects meta-analysis to get our point estimate or pooled estimate here represented by the diamond. And then also this wider interval here, the predictive interval. So we've got some studies that have a positive impact of the intervention, others suggest a negative impact of the intervention. And although our pooled estimate is pretty tight around the null, actually when we consider the predictive interval, that predictive interval tells us that really there's a lot of uncertainty about what um, the, the underlying value is in this particular data set. Um, estimate the I-squared using a two-stage approach. Turns out in this particular data set, it comes out to be 87%. Um, Q-statistic, highly statistically significant. And Tor-squared here is equal to 0 
So I'm going to go on to consider how we might replicate this, not using a two-stage approach, but a one-stage approach. So using a linear mixed model, um, Y here represents my outcome for individual I in study J in arm S. And I'm assuming that there are M people in each of my study arms. X is my treatment indicator. Did that participant get the treatment? Theta is the pooled treatment effect that I'm trying to estimate. And I've got two random effects here. The first random effect um, represents the variation between their studies under the control condition. So it just represents how the studies vary before anyone has been exposed to the treatment. Um, and that has variance tor squared sub s. So a, a, a random effect that allows different studies to respond slightly different, to, to have an underlying response in the control arm that differs a little bit. But there's another random effect here. Um, tor squared um, sub st, and that represents the variation between the studies and their response to the treatment. And this is akin to the tor squared that we commonly think about in, in meta-analysis. That describes the, random, the variation between our, our studies and their response to the treatment. And that's what we're usually interested in allowing for. Now, um, when we're analyzing the data using a one-stage approach, it turns out that from this linear mixed model, we can come up with quite an intuitive estimate of what I squared might look like. Remember that I squared was the ratio between the, um, the variances on the top of the fraction. It was the variability between um, the studies and how they respond to the treatment. On the, the bottom of the fraction, it was the sum of the two different components of variation. So naturally then, I squared could be estimated using a linear mixed model by tor squared sub st on the bottom of the fraction, tor squared st, plus here an estimate of the within study standard error and assuming continuous outcomes, large sample theory. Um, this is a, a simple approximation to our standard error of our within study specific treatment effects, where m bar is the harmonic mean of the study size per arm. And likewise, we can come up with a prediction interval from this linear mixed model um, of a similar format to what we would use in a two-stage approach. So that's a suggested approach. So using a linear mixed model, we can get an estimate of I squared. We can also get a prediction interval. So then apply that to the simulated IPD meta-analysis. <clears throat> Remember in this example, we've got a continuous outcome. The true I squared is 91%. Um, and then on this um, chart here, what I've plotted is the black represents the estimates of the um, study specific and the pooled estimates using a one stage approach. And superimposed on that are the red lines, which represent the standard um, two stage analysis approach. So here we've got two stage analysis using this individual participant data meta analysis and then alternative proposed approach. The black lines represent estimates from a one stage approach. So the black lines are actually estimated by the best linear unbiased predictors from the linear mixed model. And then we've got a pool estimate down here, which is essentially our theta and our um, standard error from the linear mixed model. And then a similar predictive interval again from the linear mixed model. And then, like I showed on the previous slide, estimating I squared as the ratio of the, um, those two different components of variation. And it turns out that in this particular data set, I squared is estimated to be 91.7% using the one stage approach. And just as a reminder, it was 87% using the two stage approach. But that was just one data set, so we can use a simulation study. What I wanted to um, measure here was the, um, the performance of the one-stage approach at estimating the I squared. We could alternatively consider other performance issues, some measures such as perhaps um, how tor squared is estimated or how the treatment effect is estimated. But in this simulation study, I was concentrating on how well I squared had been estimated. So I looked at the correlation between I squared using a one stage approach and I squared using a two stage approach and also checked for bias. Um, in each of the different scenarios, I simulated 10,000 data sets, simulated data from a linear mixed model with a random study effect and a random study by treatment interaction. 
Overall, I looked at 108 scenarios, used REML methods and Simon Lard methods to estimate the, from the estimates in the two-stage approach, looked at a variety of studies and study sizes per arm, um, allowed for some variation across the study sizes, and then looked at a wide range of I-squared statistics. Um, and this, um, gra these graphs here depict the correlation between the I squared one stage and the I squared two stage. So starting in the bottom right hand corner, we've got large studies and a lot of studies and we see that there's a very nice high correlation between the two approaches. When we cast our eye over to the left hand column where we've only got 10 studies, correlation starts to look not so great and we see probably what's happening is because there's only a few studies, um, the models start to run into difficulties estimating the between study variation. Then on the top row, we see something different, similar correlation, also not brilliant. And essentially, probably what's happening here is the models are starting to be unable to estimate the within study variance because there's not very many people within each of these simulated trial arms. Um, then went on to have a look to see whether there was any bias. Um, we know that I squared can be biased, particularly when I squared is low or I squared is high. So these plots here essentially map the point estimates and the, the precision um, of both the one stage and the two stage I squared estimates. And although these plots here do suggest that there is some bias in some scenarios, as other people have identified, there's no quick, clear winner between either of the two metrics. So I squared um, one stage doesn't perform any better than I squared two stage and likewise the opposite way around. So in summary then, we can quantify treatment effect heterogeneity directly using a one-stage approach. Um, we don't have to resort to that two-stage approach. We do have to be cautious. Um, low I-squareds and high I-squareds don't necessarily um, tell us about what's important clinically. They can just be a reflection of small and large study sizes. So it's probably best always to use these I-squareds in conjunction with a predictive interval. Um, and I came to this not as a meta-analyst, -analyz um, but as a cluster trialist. And when we're running cluster trials, we often fit our models using these linear mixed models. And it can be the case that we expect treatment effects heterogeneity across our clusters. And also in individually randomized trials, perhaps we expect treatment effect heterogeneity across different sites. And I was proposing this approach to estimate that heterogeneity in those different types of settings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heming, for a wonderful presentation. Um, a question that we have so far, I believe that refers uh, to your slide eight, says, do we want to meta-analyze such heterogeneous study results? Ah, very good point. Prob you're probably right. In that situation, I think you're right. You wouldn't want to um, put all those different point estimates together in a, in, a pool, in a pooled estimate. Yeah, very right. I was sort of using that mainly as an illustration of the method. Agree. Thank you. <laughs> 